Hello there ladies and gentlemen, Paul TX141 Walsh here, welcoming you all to the second installment of our Christmas Day Ace in a Day gameplays for the arcade mode of War Thunder. In this episode we shall be reviewing the newly arrived Junkers JU-88 C6 Heavy Fighter slash Night Fighter, a German aircraft coming at a battery rate in a 2.7 and a tier of 1. To provide you with a brief historical overview as to the Junkers 88C variant and this particular sub-variant, we begin thus. Whilst the Junkers 88 was initially conceived as a Schnell bomber, i a fast bomber, as seen in the A variant, the Luftwaffe appreciated its potential as both a Zestora, i a heavy fighter, and a Nachtjäger, a night fighter, compared to the Messerschmitt Bf 110, which was fulfilling these roles in 1941. Development on the fighter version of the Junkers 88 started in the summer of 1939 with the Junkers 88 V7 airframe prototype, where the plane's bomb sight was removed from the gondola beneath the nose, and an armament of three 7.92mm MG-17 machine guns and a single 20mm MG FFM cannon were mounted in the starboard side of the fuselage, firing through the nose. Before the prototype entered its trials, Junkers had proposed to the Luftwaffe's Technician Amt technical office Zestora versions of the Junkers 88B. While these proposals saw the design powered by two BMW 801 air-cooled radio engines, this proposal was accepted and proceeded under the designation of Junkers 88C1. The C1 would have been powered by two BMW 801 MA engines and would have been armed with two 20mm MG FF cannon and two 7.92mm MG17 machine guns. But the design never materialised due to the prioritisation of the BMW engines for the Focke 190. Trials of the prototype Junkers 88B7 kept the C variant alive with the C2 arriving in early 1940. Essentially a converted Junkers 88A1 airframe, the C2 contained the same armament as the V7 prototype, but saw the introduction of a revised nose cone and an 11mm armour bulkhead to protect the crew. The plane retained its bomb bay, able to carry 10 50kg SC-50 bombs, and was powered by two UMO 211B1 engines, also made by Junkers. The role of the Junkers 88 as a night fighter only started to be taken seriously in early 1942. Until then, only 62 Junkers 88 C2s were delivered in 1940 and 66 in 1941. Albeit these aircraft did see combat service as night fighters with Nat Jaeger Gripper Zwei, NJG2. The C4 subvariant arrived in December of 1941. It was a completely new design compared to the converted nature of the C2 whereby the C4 was based on the A4 airframe. Two 20mm MG FFM cannon were added to the ventral gondola, rearward turret defence was bolstered with two 7.92mm MG81J machine guns in circular mountains mounted behind the cockpit in a potential dorsal position, and the single 7.92mm MG15 machine gun was reintroduced to the rear of the gondola, previously discarded on the C2. The plane was initially powered by a pair of Junkers Jumo 211F1 engines, switched to the more powerful Jumo 211J1 or J2 engines by the spring of 1942, all of these engines being inverted V12s. The C6 arrived in early 1942 and was the first subvariant to be produced in large numbers, filled in the same 1340 horsepower Jumo 211J1 or J2 liquid cooled inverted V12 engines as the C4. It differed from its predecessor by having additional armour protection for its crew. It was also intended for use as a day Zestora as well as a night fighter. The plane entered combat service with NJG-2 in the Mediterranean as of April 1942, and the aft defensive armament of the plane was raised noticeably. Some fielded the two 7.92mm MG-81 machine guns in the dorsal position and a twin 7.92mm MG-81Z machine gun in the rear of the gondola. Others had one 13mm MG131 machine gun and one 7.92mm MG15 machine gun in these respective positions. The C6 entered service with KG40, an anti-shipping unit, in September of 1942, seeing service over Malta and Gibraltar. Early 1943 saw the plane enter service on the Eastern Front against Russia in the train-busting role, dispatching supply trains in the hands of KG3, KG27, KG-55 and KG-76. The plane's usage as a night fighter began in early 1943, following the arrival of a radar-equipped type in late 1942, 
field in the FUG202 or 212 Liechtenstein radio set. The radar equipped night fighter was designated Junkers 88C6B. The Zestora as Junkers 88C6A, the variant on your screen today. And these designations were retrospectively applied to the Junkers 88C6 airframes. In early 1944, the Junkers 88C6C arrived to counter the RAF's radar countermeasure device called Window, or Duppel in German. Metal foil strips essentially dropped from the skies. The C6C fielded the FUG220 Liechtenstein SN2 radar set to counter the window. Other changes of the C6C included, but were not limited to, the usage of two Junkers Jumo 211H, 1184 horsepower inverted V12 engines fitted with TK11A turbo superchargers, boosting the plane's top speed to 335 miles per hour or 539 km per hour at 30,180 feet altitude or 9,200 meters. This was from the original top speed of 307 miles per hour or 494 km an hour at 17,390 feet, 5,300 meters altitude. The other additions were a single rear firing 13mm MG131 machine gun at the rear of the cockpit canopy and two 20mm MG151 cannon mounted as Schrager music. The Junkers 88C6 was followed by the Junkers 88G variant in the late summer of 1944, where at least two thirds of the 3,200 Junkers 88C variant aircraft produced during the Second World War being Junkers 88C6s. And with our historical overview concluded, let us take a look at how the Junkers 88C6 handles in War Thunder's arcade mode. Today's gameplay is brought to you from the ground strike map Rice Terraces. For this we'll be using the following setup. APT belts are our defensive machine guns, reasoning being that whilst we do not expect our defensive machine guns to pick us up any kills on a regular basis, they are going to act more as warning devices. Thereby, using the APT belts will work to great effect. 50% of these belts is made up of armour piercing tracer rounds. If the sound of our machine guns firing does not alert us to foes on our 6, the flash of tracer past us will inform us of that. The other 50% of the belt is made up of armour piercing incendiary rounds which can on occasion set a fire on fire and cause them to burn to death on R6. For our offensive armament, starting with our machine guns once again, we are using the stealth belts, as we do not want our machine guns, which lack the overall damage output, to obscure our visibility of where our 20mm cannon rounds are going, whereby the lower muzzle velocity of our 20mm cannon means that sometimes we may always, not always hit the target, alternatively just because of the cumbersome and heavier handling nature of the aircraft in our hands, we need to redirect our fire onto a foe who we're just slightly missing. Hence we have the air target belts for our 20mm cannon as firstly they have the tracer allowing us to realign our fire when we happen to miss and also in my experience the air target belts have proven to be the most effective at taking down enemy aircraft quickly. For our gun convergence we are using a 500m gun convergence as all of our armament is based in the nose and is therefore not convergence reliant, a standard setup for myself. And as for our fuel load, we are taking the minimum 37 minutes to make it to the end of the game on scaled on fuel capacity. We start off our analysis by diving down on an enemy G4M1 bomber, and we are going to cut them apart very quickly, demonstrating the firepower at our disposal, especially in the form of the 20mm cannon. As we then go into a climb, quickly rebuilding the altitude that we sacrificed, we note that the energy retention on the C6 is not too bad. It is not 100% conservative, but still, it means that we can very quickly swoop back up to the perch from which we descended, albeit with a small sacrifice to altitude. In general it should be noted that with increasing speed, the handling of the C6 does not change too much. Only one control surface will lock up, i.e. the roll rate or the ailerons, whereby the lock up begins at 500 km an hour and maximises at 600 km an hour, compromising approximately two thirds of your roll rate, as depicted here as we try to descend on the Spitfire Mark 1A whereby we cannot get the clean shot on the target due to our roll rate lockup and the rather evasive nature of the Spitfire pilot. The other control surfaces, i.e. the rudder and elevator, do not experience any lockup at increasing speed. And for reference, your maximum speed in this aircraft, i.e. in a dive, is 826 km an hour. And this plane does not accelerate too quickly in the dive, a rather moderate dive speed acceleration. We now go in pursuit of an enemy B-18, another bomber, and we should note that the straight line acceleration of the Junkers 88C6 is not too bad. From its stall speed of 130 km an hour up to 325 km an hour on engine power alone, 
this plane accelerates quite nicely and you can boost this threshold to 400 km an hour using more emergency power. We close in here on the B-18A, picking up a critical hit as they smash for our friendly TBF, kicking the B-18 into a spiral, and let's not waste this opportunity to finish off the foe. We swing around in a bit of a hammerhead here on our rudder, and we cut them to pieces for what is our second kill, making it look like a drive-by here as we set them on fire, and then they'll use our rear turrets to finish them off, albeit the fire probably killed them rather than our rear machine gunner. Regardless, we carry our momentum through, and note that we did pick up a small degree of damage to our left engine. This plane is quite susceptible to damage to its engines even from the lightest of machine gun fire, and that is something to watch out for. The engines are sturdy and can take multiple hits, and will continue to survive for a good period of time even after they've gone red, and are turned into black on the damage indicator in the bottom left hand corner of your screen. But it's something to be wary of, the fact that you will pick up damage quite quickly in this aircraft. As we bring our momentum forward once again, we notice two foes attacking a friendly Sunderland, a Lag-3 and a MiG-3. We're going to go for the Lag-3 as they're the closer target, and we can snap back up and out of the way using our momentum to come around to the MiG-3 if needs be. Although the MiG seems to have taken a fancy for us instead, so we've made the right call. We get the lag off our Sunderland's tower, and then just carry our momentum back up into the sky, with the MiG-3 switching targets once again to the Sunderland. As we go back to altitude, we should note that in the altitude region of 1,500 metres to 5,000 metres, the Uncus 88C6 is in its element. Above 5,000 metres altitude, particularly 5,500 metres altitude, this plane begins to lose a degree of performance in its engines, and below 1,000 metres altitude in particular, this plane feels rather sluggish. In terms of its overall engine output and overall handling as well, whereby the plane does not seem to feel too comfortable to control input albeit some should be aware of the fact that if this plane acts outside of its speed range, i.e. its ideal speed range, at 275 to 475 km an hour, especially below 275 km an hour, it can feel very heavy to handle, for a heavy fighter that is, whereby your stall speed being at 130 km an hour, you can feel your stall effects coming in as early as 180 km an hour, so you need to be careful about your speed management in the middle of a dogfight. In terms of the plane's dogfighting capabilities, as we go into an extended boom and zoom pass here, this plane, compared to other heavy fighters it can face, lacks the overall turning capability, especially against the likes of the Kai 45s and the Bowfighter Mark VI. We see here how a little bit of an accuracy of our 20mm cannon cost us a clean cut kill on the A6M2N, and we carry our momentum through here to slaughter a Hurricane Mark IV, and we can't get our nose up in time to attack another Hurricane, so we picked up our fourth kill. We dare not try to snap onto the lag free 8 too early here, we want to make them cut across us. We almost get a hit there, albeit we open fire a little bit too late. We cross once again, aim a little bit too high on the target in a set of scissors, and now we carry our momentum through. To continue that set of turns and cuts in a scissors would be suicide to us, as we bleed a lot of our energy and the lag free can rebuild their energy faster. Our rear gunners are firing at the lag free, and that'll be enough to dissuade them as we pick up our ace in the down the Spitfire Mark 1A here. For a future comparison with regards to other heavy fighters, this plane lacks the climb rate of say the Kai 45 and has a comparable climb rate to the likes of the Bowfighter Mark VI, and it can outclimb the likes of the Dornier 217J1 and J2 quite easily as we pick up another kill, our sick on the lag free from earlier, before we snap over the top once again. Are there any other things to note about this aircraft? Well, in general you have a nice distribution of gunners, meaning that any foe on your 6, whether they be above, level of you or behind, will be exposed to your gunners at some point, and you'll get the warning, as we rip apart the P26AP shooter for our 7th and final kill, as the game comes to its end, and it's time for us to take a look at the post-game stats. With our 7 kills we are able to pick up 35,300 silver lines and 2,258 research points. To defeat the C6 in a given matchup I can recommend one or two approaches. The first, in the vast majority of cases a heavy fighter, and on top of that for all mono engine fighters, is to turn fight with this aircraft, and if you happen to see it lighting up at altitude, being resilient to dive down, simply climb up to roughly the same altitude bait it into a head-on, and then use a snap roll to get past it, and come around before it can turn around on you. Whereby the wide turn circle of the C6, approximately the same as an A20G Havoc, will let it down considerably. 
and the pilot will have trouble getting a clean shot on you in a head-on, simply because, whilst the plane has a balanced set of control surfaces, the plane does not have the flexibility in its controls to precisely track in the pone in a head-on pass. Therefore, a turn fight will work very well, just be wary of the rear face in 7.92mm machine guns and the fact that a sustained period of time behind these guns can lead to you picking up some damage. The alternative approach, if you're not keen on turn fighting with the aircraft, if you're in the likes of a Dornier 217J1, is to try and bounce this aircraft when it comes out of a boom and zoom pass down in the low altitude furballs. Whereby, as this plane goes to go back up to altitude, you'll be able to hit it hard as it has to bleed a good chunk of its kinetic energy, or its speed, in order to gain altitude. As we said at the start, this plane can gain roughly 1000 meters altitude, starting at 400 kilometers an hour for its climb, before it needs to level out, rebuild its speed, and start again. In conclusion, the Junkers 88C6 is a rather enjoyable aircraft, and a brilliant way of introducing oneself to the world of heavy fighters in War Thunder's arcade mode. It provides the pilot with a balanced set of characteristics in terms of manoeuvrability, firepower and engine performance, enabling the pilot to go around in the higher altitude portions of the sky doing what heavy fighters do best, bringing down the enemy bombers and preventing any further intrusion attempts. Indeed this Christmas, if you fly out in this aircraft and you handle it accordingly, you'll be finding that the skies above your bases will be quiet, just like a silent night. And so I've been TX141, and if you've enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future War Thunder videos on my channel. I bid you all a Merry Christmas, ladies and gentlemen, and as always, take care, and good luck in the skies.